The fifth generation F-35 Lightning II fighter produced by Lockheed Martin is considered one of the most advanced modern fighters. Over 970 combat aircraft have already been built and plans are underway to produce over 3,500 more, not only for the needs of the United States but also for their partners worldwide. The Department of Defense expects it to serve as the primary fighter for decades, much like the role the F-16 was intended to play decades ago. Partly due to technical innovation and a range of non-standard and innovative solutions implemented in the aircraft and its variants, the F-35 program is rightfully considered one of the most expensive in the history of military developments. The cost of one such aircraft can reach $100 million. Not surprisingly, the program has faced significant cost overruns and production delays, with its final estimate now exceeding $1.7 trillion. Partly because of the high cost of the program and partly due to regular technical malfunctions and accidents, including human casualties as well as the constant need for refinement of already deployed aircraft, the F-35 is arguably the most controversial project in the history of the U.S. Department of Defense. Military officials are still trying to figure out what went wrong when an F-35 jet crashed in South Carolina during a training exercise this week. Now a South Carolina man has gone viral for his description of what that crash sounded like. It was a horrible sound. Accordingly, the first tragic incident occurred on April 9, 2019, when the F-35A aircraft belonging to the 302nd Air Squadron of the Japan Air Self-Defense Force crashed over the Pacific Ocean. Japanese authorities confirmed that the wreckage found in the Pacific Ocean is the fighter jet that went missing on Tuesday. It is the second F-35 to crash in two decades. The crash took place 135 kilometers east of the Masawa base during a training flight. The pilot of the F-35A, 41-year-old Major Akanomi Hasomi, perished. However, Japan's defense minister Takeshi Oweya did not blame the manufacturers of the F-35, stating that the technical characteristics of the aircraft had no relation to the accident. Instead, he attributed the cause of the tragedy to Major Akanomi Hashomi losing orientation during flight. The details of how the experienced Japanese pilot lost orientation during the flight were not clarified. It reached the point that in 2021, the U.S. Air Force even stated that this aircraft is too expensive and unreliable for service, and it will never become a proper workhorse to replace the F-16 as originally planned. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Manhattan. And in this episode, we will explore whether the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II fighter is really as bad as everyone says or not. You will learn about the history of its development, details about the Joint Strike Fighter competition, the differences between all three modifications, and interim conclusions to date. We'll delve into the involvement of Russian specialists in creating the short takeoff and vertical landing versions of the aircraft, touch upon the generation of fighters, economic aspects, and much, much more. The emergence of the F-35 is the result of the work of a state military program known as Joint Strike Fighter. It brought together several projects for advanced aircraft that were being developed for various branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. The U.S. Air Force was seeking a prospective replacement for two aircraft, the A-10 and the F-16. The A-10 Thunderbolt II is a ground attack aircraft designed for close air support, manufactured by Fairchild Republic. This aircraft is literally built around the 7-barrel 30mm Avenger cannon, which occupies more than half of the fuselage. The specific use of the A-10 in combat became a reason to search for its replacement. Flying directly over the battlefield in the presence of mobile air defense systems posed a significant risk of losses for these ground attack aircraft. Military priorities shifted towards conducting long-range airstrikes using precision-guided weapons. By the way, there's a separate video on this channel about the A-10 Thunderbolt, also known as the Warthog for its rugged appearance. See the link in the description. The second aircraft for which the U.S. Air Force sought an alternative was the F-16 multi-role lightweight fighter, manufactured by General Dynamics. Its low acquisition and operating cost, along with good flight and technical characteristics, defined its overall success. 
The F-16 is the most widely produced fourth-generation fighter, with slightly over 4,500 aircraft delivered to 34 countries. Despite its numerous advantages, the F-16 had a relatively short combat radius. To address this issue, external and conformal fuel tanks were used, but they noticeably reduced its maneuverability. In addition to an increased combat radius, the Air Force desired an alternative aircraft with minimal radar cross-section. The preference shifted towards long and medium-range air-to-air combat, where missiles are launched before the aircraft is detected. Such a concept of aerial warfare was envisioned for the F-22 fighter, which was under development at the time. In addition to the Air Force, the Navy was also involved in the development of a prospective aircraft. They were seeking a replacement for the F-A-18 Hornet multi-role fighter manufactured by McDonnell Douglas. The Navy had similar requirements for the future aircraft as the Air Force did for an alternative to the F-16. A significant increase in combat radius, reduced radar cross-section, and increased payload. Another branch of the U.S. Armed Forces, the Marine Corps, in collaboration with the British Royal Navy, was looking for a replacement for the Harrier short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft. The requirements for the prospective strike fighter were even more demanding here and were mainly related to operational specificity. Harriers were characterized by a high accident rate, so the new aircraft had to take several steps forward in terms of flight safety. Additionally, it had to be capable of supersonic flight, a feature not available in the Harrier. Other requirements mostly overlapped with those set by the Air Force and Navy for their prospective strike fighters. A crucial moment in the history of this aircraft was a rather original and controversial decision made by the U.S. Department of Defense in the mid-1990s to consolidate several programs for the development of prospective strike fighters into one. The military aimed to maximize cost savings in development and production by using a common airframe and avionics set for all customers. Following the conceptual design competition, two out of four contenders were eliminated, McDonnell Douglas and Northrop Grumman. In November of 1996, the Department of Defense announced that Boeing and Lockheed Martin would continue the competition. These contractors are Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Each company was tasked with creating two demonstrator aircraft, one for conventional and carrier-based operations intended for use by the Air Force and Navy, and the other for the Marine Corps and the Royal Air Force, featuring short takeoff and vertical landing capabilities. The conclusion of the competition was scheduled for 2001, when all aircraft would complete their flight test. The battle for the contract promised to be intense. From the very start of the program, it was clear that the Joint Strike Fighter project was poised to become the most expensive in aviation history. The U.S. Department of Defense announced plans to purchase approximately 3,000 new advanced combat aircraft. The direct rivalry began in the fall of 2000 when the test flights commenced. Boeing's aircraft were designated X-32, while Lockheed Martin's prototypes were named X-35. The competitors not only opted for completely different designs for their aircraft, but also chose different methods to showcase their capabilities. Boeing produced two prototypes under the X-32 designation. The first aircraft, created for demonstrating conventional and carrier-based operations, was named X-32A and made its maiden flight in September 2000. The second prototype, X-32B, featuring short takeoff and vertical landing capabilities, commenced flight testing six months later in March of 2001. In Lockheed Martin, a more original approach was chosen. The prototype of the conventional takeoff and landing fighter, designated X-35A, took flight in October 2000. Less than two months later, in December of the same year, the second aircraft, X-35C, began flight testing. This version was intended to demonstrate carrier-based operations using a catapult for takeoff. Unlike the X-35A, it featured an enlarged wing area to reduce landing speed and enhance controllability during glide. To showcase a high degree of production universalization, a key requirement from the customer, Lockheed Martin engineers efficiently modified the X-35A prototype into a short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft within a short time frame. The aircraft received the designation X-35B. This doesn't go well. Here we go. 70%. Bottle up. No 
Thumbs up. Come on, Simon. Come on, baby. Yeah! Thus, Lockheed Martin effectively demonstrated three modifications of the aircraft, and this decision became one of the contributing factors to their overall success in the competition. To highlight the differences in design approaches, let's briefly compare the developments of both participants. The X-32 prototypes had a common triangular wing, a fuselage with a large cross-section housing a single air intake, and two fins with a slight outward cant. The X-35, on the other hand, followed a more traditional aerodynamic scheme, a trapezoidal wing with horizontal tail surfaces, two widely spaced fins set at a slight angle to the vertical and lateral air intakes. According to the competition requirements, all aircraft were equipped with a single Pratt & Whitney F-19 turbofan engine, providing a maximum takeoff thrust of 15.5 tons. This engine was also used in the power plant of the Lockheed Martin F-22 fighter. The competitors took different approaches to the design of the short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft, generating particular interest. Boeing's X-32B was equipped with two swiveling nozzles, placed closer to the center of mass. The nozzle at the rear of the fuselage had the capability of deflecting the thrust vector in the vertical plane. Lockheed Martin's approach turned out to be more technologically advanced. In the X-35B prototype, vertical takeoff and landing were achieved through a combination of a swiveling nozzle and a lift fan. The lift fan, connected by a drive shaft to the lift engine, played a crucial role. Such a combination of these two technical solutions on a single aircraft had never been seen before, even in experimental machines. It's interesting to note that the development of the swiveling nozzle was influenced by the experience of Soviet designers who had implemented a similar solution in the deck-based Yak-141 fighter, but more on that a bit later. On October 16, 2001, during a briefing at the Department of Defense, Lockheed Martin was announced as the winner of the competition. At that moment, the future fighter officially received its designation, F-35. One of the biggest deciding factors in this competition, in my opinion, was that Boeing never managed to make a vertical landing with the aircraft in complete configuration. They took the inlet cowl off, they took the landing gear doors off. Lockheed Martin made complete vertical landings with the aircraft in the same trim that it could go to supersonic speed in. The victory of Lockheed Martin was not a surprise for those following the program. The success was largely attributed to the short takeoff and vertical landing version, the X-35B. The Department of Defense observers were positively influenced by a landmark test flight in which this prototype took off using a 150-meter or 500-foot runway, reached supersonic speeds, and then landed vertically. Boeing's X-32B couldn't complete such a program. Moreover, it never reached supersonic speed due to the specific shape of its air intake. Boeing's failure in this competition was not solely due to shortcomings in short takeoff and vertical landing versions. Even before the final prototypes were built, the Department of Defense, represented by its customers, constantly adjusted requirements for all three versions of the future fighter. The Navy and Marine Corps, in particular, made numerous amendments. This situation almost led to Boeing's withdrawal from the competition. The proposed concept with a triangular wing no longer aligned with the significantly changed requirements, especially for the version intended for the Navy. However, it was already too late to make changes, as the prototypes were in the construction stage and the entire budget had been nearly fully spent. Notably, the Department of Defense prohibited competitors from investing their own or external funds to avoid inflating the already substantial cost of the JSF program. Boeing and Lockheed Martin collectively received almost a billion dollars in government funding. Despite the changing conditions of the competition several times, the X-32 prototypes completed the test program. Simultaneously, Boeing engineers worked on an alternative version of their aircraft, but they couldn't materialize it in metal. The updated representation of the aircraft could be seen at the announcement ceremony of the competition. Scale models were displayed on the table for Boeing representatives. The presumed prototype featured horizontal stabilizers, and the wing no longer had a triangular shape. Nevertheless, the winner was known. 
Lockheed Martin proved to be more successful and adaptable to the constantly evolving customer requirements. Let's return to the present time. It's been over 20 years since the end of the competition. Let's see how Lockheed Martin, in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Defense, has fared up to the present day with the fighter created within the Joint Strike Fighter program. The officially designated F-35, as intended, comes in three variants. The F-35A, a conventional takeoff and landing version, is designated for the Air Force and was adopted into service in 2016. The F-35B, a short takeoff and vertical landing fighter for the Marine Corps and Royal Air Force, was adopted a year earlier in 2015. The F-35C, a carrier-based modification for the Navy, was adopted into service in 2019. In addition to the United States and the United Kingdom, 16 more countries have either adopted or plan to adopt various versions of the F-35, namely Denmark, Israel, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, South Korea, Belgium, Germany, Canada, Poland, Singapore, Finland, Czech Republic, and Switzerland. Some of these customers are already integrating these aircraft into their fleets. Currently, there are over 970 aircraft in service, with plans to produce over 3,500 more. Well, enough of the dry facts. Ahead lies a detailed examination of aviation technology and the exploration of answers to the most popular questions. The Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II is a multi-role fighter, commonly classified as a fifth-generation fighter. This classification, however, is contested by some analysts and experts who often take a one-sided position, favoring a particular aircraft that, in their view, fully meets the criteria of a fifth-generation fighter. In general, there is no strict division of fighters into generations, and there's no universally accepted document with established criteria to easily determine whether a fighter belongs to a specific generation. Nevertheless, there is an informal classification with certain patterns. Each new generation of fighters has features that are fundamentally different from those of the previous generation. For fifth-generation fighters, a central characteristic is the significant reduction in observability in infrared and radar ranges. This is achieved through specific airframe geometry, the use of special absorbing materials, and the implementation of onboard electronic equipment capable of operating in special modes without the risk of detection. Low observability is the defining feature that distinguishes a fifth-generation fighter from fourth-generation aircraft and allows for a substantial shift in tactical use. Moreover, distinctive characteristics inherent to 4-plus and 4-plus-plus generations can be partially or fully incorporated into a fifth-generation fighter depending on the requirements set for the aircraft. For instance, the Russian Su-57 fighter has integrated nearly all significant features of 4-plus and 4-plus-plus generations, but, likely for various reasons, may not possess the most outstanding low observability characteristics. On the other hand, American fifth-generation fighters such as the F-22 and F-35 are undisputed leaders in this aspect. Lockheed Martin has been involved in stealth technology research for over 40 years and has considerable experience in creating low observable aircraft. The U.S. military prioritized the concept of first to detect, first to shoot for its fighters, emphasizing engagements at medium and long ranges, making super low observability crucial. The Russian military adheres to a different perspective, believing that the era of close range air combat is not over, and emphasizing is the importance of a highly maneuverable aircraft combined with pilot skill. In dogfights, the F-22 and F-35 are expectedly outperformed by many fourth-generation fighters, as demonstrated in training exercises on multiple occasions. Of course, engaging in close-range dogfights is undesirable for the fifth-generation fighters, and they will seek to avoid such situations in actual combat. Their advantages are optimized for engagements at medium and long ranges, a point that has been convincingly demonstrated in numerous NATO military exercises. Let's delve into the details of the F-35 after the conclusion of the JSF competition in 2002. Lockheed Martin began the development of prototypes for testing. Let's explore all three F-35 variants that were introduced. F-35A 
This variant is designated for conventional takeoff and landing, intended for deployment on regular airfields. The first prototype took to the skies on December 15, 2006. Five years later, in February 2011, the first production model began flight testing, and in the same year, deliveries to the United States military commenced. The airframe of the F-35A does not differ much from the X-35A prototype that participated in the competition. However, it required some modifications due to the introduction of numerous technological hatches and two internal weapon bays. The aircraft's construction extensively utilizes composite materials, constituting up to 35% of its mass. The airframe's shapes are designed to achieve maximum low observability in all projections. Most joints of panels have a sawtooth shape. To further reduce the aircraft's observability, a special radar-absorbing coating is applied to the airframe. The air intakes have a S-shaped channel form, thereby covering the compressor blades. According to some experts, the F-35 is believed to have a relatively high radar cross-section, a quantitative measure of an aircraft's ability to scatter electromagnetic waves. However, it is not usually specified on what basis such conclusions are drawn, as the exact value of the RCS for a specific aircraft in a particular projection can only be determined experimentally. At present, the widely recognized record holder for the lowest radar cross-section is the F-22 Raptor, another fighter produced by Lockheed Martin. By the way, there's a separate video about the F-22 Raptor on this channel. You can find the link in the description. The F-35 incorporates similar measures to reduce observability, with the exception of the flat nozzle of the turbojet engine and the presence of a bump on the canopy, which, however, is made from radio-transparent composite materials. Moreover, during the time between the design of the F-22 and the F-35, the computational power of computer technology has increased significantly significantly, making it theoretically much easier to calculate the predicted RCS. The complexity of computer calculations for the effective radar cross-section is what prompted Lockheed Martin engineers to create the F-117 stealth attack aircraft using only flat faceted shapes, which could be easily calculated with the computers available at the time. The F-35A is equipped with a single Pratt & Whitney F-135 turbofan engine, specifically the PW-100 variant. Its maximum thrust with afterburner is approximately 19.5 tons, setting a record for a single-engine fighter. The maximum thrust without afterburner is 13 tons. According to Lockheed Martin, the non-afterburning thrust of the F-135 engine allows the fighter to maintain sustained supersonic flight at 1.3 Mach for up to a distance of 400 kilometers with a maximum combat radius of 1,100 kilometers for the F-35A. It's worth mentioning that the F-135 engine is derived from the F-119 engine, which is used in the F-22 Raptor. F-35B is a short takeoff and vertical landing variant designed for deployment on the ships of the U.S. Marine Corps and the Royal Navy's aircraft carriers. The main difference from the F-35 version lies in the propulsion system. Similar to the X-32B prototype presented in the JSF competition, the vertical takeoff and landing are accomplished through the use of a swiveling nozzle on the lift fan propulsion system and a lift fan located behind the pilot's cockpit. The system, known as the lift system, was developed by British company Rolls-Royce and plays a crucial role in the aircraft's short takeoff and landing capabilities. This is the lift system. It's used to power the F-35B in the short takeoff and vertical landing modes of operation. So at the very front here, we have the lift fan, which is the main module of the system. Uh, it's used to redirect air. It sucks it in, points it downwards, which help provides the thrust. Uh, towards the back here, we have the three bearing swivel module. This also takes um, a lot of the air that goes through the main propulsion system and also uh, directs it downwards to also provide the lift. Um, and then finally, over here, we have the roll posts. These are used for the sideways thrust vectoring, which helps uh, balance 
uh, the, uh, the aircraft when it's landing. Lockheed Martin in the early 1990s sought technical solutions for a perspective short takeoff and vertical landing fighter. There were two critical challenges the designers faced, how to make the future aircraft supersonic and how to minimize the temperature of gases entering the engine during takeoff and landing. Since Lockheed Martin lacked direct experience in developing vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and time constraints prevented extensive in-house research, the decision was made to seek a partner with significant experience in the field. Rolls-Royce, a British company with substantial experience in vertical takeoff and landing aircraft development, particularly the Harrier, became the exclusive partner. The scheme involving a lift fan was quickly agreed upon, but a unified solution for achieving supersonic flight was more challenging. Meanwhile, the world already had a vertical takeoff and landing combat aircraft capable of supersonic flight, the Soviet Yak-141. Developed by the Yakovlev Design Bureau, it first took to the skies in the spring of 1987. The Yak-141 featured a swiveling nozzle with three sections that rotated in opposite directions, providing vector thrust deflection. The remarkable characteristics of this nozzle was its ability to withstand the afterburning mode of the engine, crucial for achieving supersonic speeds. Lockheed Martin expressed interest in the developments of their Russian colleagues and proposed collaboration. As a result, the American company gained access to the technical documentation for the nozzle and insights from the operational experience of the Yak-141's nozzle. Specialists evaluated the durability of this design under real operation conditions and explored possibilities for upgrades. Lockheed Martin intended to manufacture the swiveling nozzle independently, leveraging the acquired expertise and knowledge from the Yakovlev Design Bureau. However, for reasons not fully disclosed, Lockheed Martin terminated its collaboration with the Russian colleagues and assigned the development of the swiveling nozzle to British company Rolls-Royce. What the F-35B allows is, is for the short takeoff and vertical landing capability. And this is achieved using the Rolls-Royce lift fan in conjunction with the main engine and also with the three uh, BSM. It remains unclear whether Rolls-Royce utilized the insights from Soviet designers. Thus, the British company became the sole contractor entrusted with creating components to enable vertical takeoff and landing for the future fighter jet. The entire system was showcased during the testing of the X-35B prototype on June 23, 2001, when the aircraft vertically lifted off the ground for the first time. Exactly seven years later, on June 11, 2008, the prototype of the F-35B made its maiden flight. It featured an upgraded vertical takeoff and landing system named the Rolls-Royce Lift System. This system comprises a swiveling nozzle, a lift fan, and two jet nozzles. The Pratt & Whitney F-135 turbofan engine, the same one used as the sole lift fan propulsion, boasts a maximum thrust of 19.5 tons. In short takeoff and vertical landing mode, the lift fan located behind the pilot's cockpit is engaged. It is set in motion through a shaft connected to the engine via a special coupling. Air enters the lift fan through the upper air intake, which is closed during regular flight or on the ground by a large door. Behind the lift fan, there is a controllable nozzle that directs the airflow to balance the aircraft. The air intakes for the turbofan engine and the lift fan are separate. Wing-mounted thrust vectoring nozzles are employed for roll control, drawing air from the F-135 engine compressor. The inclusion of the vertical takeoff and landing system makes the F-35B modification the most expensive among the three variants. In 2014, the engine for the F-35A cost around $20 million, while for the F-35B version, the price was already $40 million for the engine and Rolls-Royce lift system components. As of 2016, the cost of power plants has nearly halved and amounted to $13 and $19 million respectively. This reduction is attributed to the overall optimization of the F-35 program and preparation for mass production. Moving on to the F-35C, it is a carrier-based variant designed for the United States Navy. The first prototype of this modification took its maiden flight on June 6, 2010. The F-35C underwent military testing until 2019, partly due to the later launch of the carrier version into experimental production. The first F-35C prototype took off almost four years later than the F-35A.
The power plant of the aircraft consists of the same Pratt & Whitney F-135 turbofan engine, PW100 modification, with a maximum afterburning thrust of 19.5 tons. The airframe of the aircraft had to be significantly modified to adapt to carrier-based operations. The primary changes were to the wing and stabilizer. The wing area increased by one and a half times compared to the F-35A version, from 43 to 62 square meters or 200 square feet. This allowed for an increase in maximum fuel mass by almost 700 kilograms without affecting the combat radius, which remains at 1,100 kilometers or 700 miles, the same as the F-35A. With the increased wing area of the F-35C, the wing's mechanization area has also significantly grown. The F-35C possesses all the necessary characteristics and functions typical of an aircraft based on an aircraft carrier. The aircraft's wings are foldable, a tailhook for landing, and the landing gear has undergone significant modifications and reinforcements. The front landing gear now has two wheels instead of one. In addition to the information on all three F-35 variants, here are a few more comparative facts. Different fueling systems are used for in-flight refueling. The land-based F-35A variant receives fuel using a telescopic boom installed on the tanker, which is a traditional method for the Air Force. The carrier-based F-35B and F-35C modifications are equipped with a retractable probe, which connects to the drogue on the tanker hose. All three variants of the fighter have different operational overload limitations, a result of the structural characteristics of each modification. The F-35B, the short takeoff and vertical landing version, has the lowest limit, not exceeding 7 units. For the carrier-based F-35C, this value does not exceed 7.5 units. The F-35A, the conventional takeoff and landing version, has the most robust overload resistance, with a standard value for modern fighters of 9 units. F-35 has two internal weapons bays, each with two attachment points. One of them is adapted for larger payloads weighing up to 1,100 kilograms. A typical configuration includes 910 kilogram precision-guided bombs like the GBU-31. The second attachment point is designed for lighter payloads weighing up to 160 kilograms, often carrying medium-range air-to-air missiles like the AIM-120 AMRAAM. In addition to the internally stored weapons, external pylons can be added for additional ordnance. In such cases, the fighter can achieve its maximum combat load. The F-35A and F-35C variants can carry up to 8 tons of weapons, while the F-35B is limited to 6,800 kilograms. Due to its unique design, the maximum weight of a single weapon carried by the internal bay is also significantly restricted for the F-35B, reduced from 1 ton to 450 kilograms. The F-35A, the land-based version, is equipped with an integrated 25mm four-barrel gun with an ammunition capacity of 180 rounds. The other two variants have the option of carrying an external pod mounted on the lower part of the fuselage. The F-35 fighter is intended to be used in two configurations depending on the situation in the theater of military operations. The first configuration allows for the placement of weapons only in internal bays. In this scenario, the aircraft requires the lowest visibility and maximum operational characteristics when approaching the combat zone. In this case, the thrust-to-weight ratio of the F-35 when approaching the target will exceed 1. The typical armament in this case includes two medium-range AIM-120 AMRAAM air-to-air missiles and two guided GBU-31 bombs, each weighing 910 kilograms. The second configuration involves using weapons on external pylons. This significantly reduces the characteristics of stealth and maneuverability of the fighter, but fully reveals its strike potential. The F-35 is capable of carrying the entire arsenal of weapons used on modern American fighter bombers. It can do so due to a large set of onboard electronic equipment which deserves a separate detailed story outside the scope of this narrative. The F-35 is equipped with the AN-APG-81 Phased Array Radar, manufactured by Northrop Grumman. 
It is used for detecting and tracking targets on the ground and in the air, mapping terrain, target identification, and electronic warfare. One of the distinguishing features of the AN-APG-81, often highlighted by experts in their reviews, is its high resolution when operating on the ground, with a maximum resolution of 30 by 30 centimeters. In addition to the onboard radar, the F-35 is equipped with an AN-AAQ-37 electro-optical targeting system, which includes six high-resolution infrared sensors. This mirrored window is part of the distributed aperture system, or DAS. Its capabilities include detecting and tracking airborne targets, providing missile attack warnings, and generating images for night vision systems. The equipment of the F-35 fighters also includes the AN-AAQ-40 all-aspect high-resolution infrared camera and the AN-ASQ-239 electronic warfare system. A special helmet has been developed for F-35 pilots, providing them with a spherical view of the space around the aircraft. One way is through the use of the Helmet Mounted Display System, or HMDS. Now, let's take a look at the main issues of this aircraft and try to understand what exactly has caused its controversy and how justified it is. The F-35 remains in every sense nothing more than an expensive prototype rushed into mass production, claims Dan Grazer, a government project oversight employee based on the latest report from the U.S. Department of Defense. But this year we find out that not only can the aircraft not shoot straight, but when the pilot fires the, fires the cannon, he actually breaks the aircraft. Grazer identified and, four and problems with the Lightning either, II. So. The first one is the lack of a simulation environment in which the fighter could demonstrate its effectiveness during peacetime. That is, its ability to withstand existing threats and air defense systems. Ten years after the fighter was adopted into service, such a simulator has not been created. The second issue is that the F-35 has become a record holder in terms of failures and malfunctions. Engineers can't fix one defect before a new one is discovered. The aircraft still has 871 serious deficiencies, with 10 of them falling into the critical category meaning they are capable of causing death, severe injury, or loss of a weapon system. For many years, one of the main problems of the project was the cloud network system for technical maintenance and parts, known as ALIS. In theory, it was supposed to monitor the condition of specific aircraft, remind of the need for current service and repairs, and order spare parts. In practice, it didn't work. In 2020, the project's creator admitted defeat and disabled ALIS. It is planned to replace it with another cloud service, but the authors of the Pentagon report warn that many of the mistakes made before are being repeated in this development. Finally, the key point is that the F-35 project is not based on the necessary combat qualities of a future fighter, but rather on technological requirements, new sensors, radio-absorbing coatings, and intricate cockpit equipment. The fundamental flaws of the aircraft were initially embedded in its design. As an example, Grazier mentions the A-10 Thunderbolt II, a cost-effective and reliable ground support aircraft. As a ground support aircraft, it needs to fly low, have a powerful gun, and carry a large number of weapons under its wings. That's it. No need for supersonic speed or the ability to take off from an aircraft carrier. Nothing beyond what is essential for performing its primary task. In contrast, the Lightning II project took the opposite approach. Designers took a mass of untested but impressive technologies and tried to build an aircraft out of them. So, what do we have as of today? The F-35 is undoubtedly a unique project with an extremely complex history, emerging in conditions of constantly changing requirements from one of its main clients even during the design phase. The designers were able to adapt to these requirements promptly, creating a truly versatile aircraft. The F-35 is the most controversial project of the U.S. Department of Defense in the 21st century. Lockheed Martin and its contractors have certainly contributed significantly to the F-35's bad reputation, but this can be reasonably explained. Technologically, it is the most complex project in modern combat aviation history, hence the incredibly large number of problems that have plagued the developers. The refinement of the F-35 is a process that will undoubtedly extend over the next 10 to 15 years at best, but let's look at it from another perspective. 
The F-35 is the most transparent project in the history of military aviation. In the years 2015 through 17, it seems like every F-35 produced had its own Instagram or Twitter account, posting its entire history, which journalists then used to build their exposés. However, despite all of this, various versions of the F-35 are already in service with a number of technologically advanced countries, and the interest in joining the club continues to grow. This clearly indicates that the F-35, created by Lockheed Martin, has extremely high demand in the market. You have to agree, if the aircraft were as bad as journalists sometimes try to portray it, seeking the next sensation, it would not be in service with so many countries, and production plans would be significantly lower. And that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Give it a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Let us know what else you'd like to hear on our channel, and see you soon!